Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, June 28th, 527 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are a little bit higher this morning. Matt Bennett is here. Guys, we've got some building dryness in the eastern Corn Belt. So over the last week, precipitation across the Corn Belt was primarily limited to the upper and western portions of the region. Drought conditions improved in Wisconsin and Iowa. Southern Minnesota, southeast South Dakota, and northwest Iowa received excessive rainfall, leading to widespread flash flooding and river flooding. Much of the eastern Corn Belt saw worsening drought conditions. Drought conditions across the High Plains were mostly unchanged last week, with the exception of improved conditions in southwest Kansas and northern Oklahoma. When we look at, when we look at the percentage of U.S. areas experiencing drought, corn country, 6%, soybeans, 7%, winter wheat, 21%, spring wheat, 5%, and cattle country, 12%. All right, Matthew, we're going to look at current and future weather here in a second. But as it relates to past weather, you've got an eastern corn belt that is drying out. There's it's not drought, but it's it's building dryness is what you've got in parts of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. And then in the West, you've got a lot of areas that people would say are too wet. Is this is this the setup that you need for a, a 181 national corn yield? I don't believe it is, you know, I mean, I don't want to be sounding the alarm bell, so to speak, but, you know, we talked about this earlier in the year, this spring is not a good time to exacerbate your drought issues. And that's what happened in the West. So uh, clearly, uh, in my opinion, the agronomic issues that goes along with, you know, are something that will definitely rear their head later in the growing season. As far as the Eastern Corn Belt, I'm right in the middle of some of this. Yeah, you know, we're dry uh, in a lot of these areas. We, it's kind of been kind of a flash drought type thing, you know, over the last three weeks, you know, some of my farms have had maybe a quarter inch, you know, and uh, the, so the 95s uh, basically are magnified just a little bit more uh, in the east. Uh, we've got a fair amount of subsoil moisture. I think your black ground is going to be fine as long as you can catch some rain. The problem is sometimes when you get in this rut and you have no moisture in the atmosphere and you're part of the world, it's really hard to get a rain. So I got to hope that uh, some of the forecasts that we are looking at, some of the forecasts we've looked at this week are right, uh, that the Eastern Corn Belt is going to start catching rain. Because if they do, quite frankly, you're going to have a lot of really good corn in the Eastern Corn Belt. The word that I've heard to use uh, used to describe conditions across the Corn Belt, both as a whole and, and regionally, is, is variability. There's a lot of variability. And when there's variability, that's not usually associated with a record yield. No, I mean, I agree. There's no doubt. And uh, that's what I've said all along is that the spring wasn't one of these where you get out and you go and over the course of 10 days, your crops planted. It was, hey, we're going to pick uh, our driest fields, our uh, pattern tiled fields, uh, which is what we did. I think our operation was very similar to a lot of folks this spring in that we planted our pattern tiled stuff uh, right off the bat. You know, that, that was planted in April. That corn looks phenomenal today. It really does. Uh, we haven't had a whole lot of rain on it, but it's still hanging on. It looks pretty darn good. Uh, then we had to sit around and wait just a little bit, and then you pick your fields, you know. And, and once you get, uh, you know, when you're in early April, you don't plant a field that you would say is marginal. Uh, but whenever you're in mid to late May, all of a sudden your decision making starts to change just a little bit. So when you plant into marginal soils, uh, typically you have uh, – you know, compaction, uh, you know, obviously whenever you catch a ton of rain, like a lot of these folks do, then you start to talk about nitrogen loss, you know, stand count issues. So, you know, I think that a lot of those issues will raise their head. It's just that you're not going to see those till later in the year. We do have a fairly active radar this morning. So early morning rain pushed across Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. The system, however, is expected to stop short of the Eastern Corn Belt. Both the Euro and GFS models introduce more generalized Corn Belt rainfall during the 5-10 to 10 day period. Accumulation is expected to begin around uh, July 3rd in parts of eastern Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. And underperformance of this system could result in crop concerns given the building dryness in the east. Matt, we haven't, uh, to this point yet in the growing season, we haven't had one of these Sunday night sessions that's filled with weather volatility because of a big shift. Um, it would be nice for the sake of the market if maybe you were to shift drier over the weekend for the Eastern Corn Belt, because if you did, I think that would be something. Yeah, it would. 
You know, it would, especially if you come in with, um, you know, numbers that are at least supportive, you know, on the report. So, you know, if, if you come in and maybe you surprise a few people and, and the market's up, uh, you know, uh, just a little bit here today, uh, who knows? I mean, I think you come in here Sunday night and you ship dryer with some of these areas that are already experiencing some stress. Um, you know, you're talking about some heat building in in some areas as well. So, you know, if that's the case, I don't know, maybe you finally start to get a little bit of a story. If you really look at these maps, so the euro on the left, if you guys are watching, is is very wet, very generalized in terms of the rainfall. The GFS leaves some of the eastern Corn Belt dry even through the 10-day period, like uh, where you're at, Matt, parts of Indiana, even parts of Ohio left a little bit drier. So uh, forecast five to 10 days out is very difficult to predict. And you you could, there's, there's a possibility that things shift around on Sunday night. But for now, it's a wet forecast going into 4th of July, which is never a friendly item. No, no. USDA will release its planted acreage and quarterly grain stocks uh, report here this morning at 11 central time. Traders expect that planted U.S. corn acreage will rise modestly compared to March intentions. A modest rise is also expected in U.S. soybean acreage compared to March. June 1st stocks of corn, soybeans, and wheat are likely to be dra drastically higher compared uh, to the same period last year. Based on this week's market behavior, it appears that traders are anticipating a bearish report. All right, Matt, what are your projections for uh, the acreage numbers? You guys at Ag Market had some numbers out, didn't you? We did. And basically, we we said that from March intentions, corn, beans, and wheat would all be higher. Okay. Um, there's several reasons that we thought that. And you Why are you such a perma bearer? Uh, yeah, I've been accused of that more than once in my career. Uh, you know, I, I, it's not that it's just that I, again, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. So 6 million acres don't show up that were around last year. Yeah. I mean, uh, what's the general trend whenever profit margins continue to dip, uh, acres vanish. Okay. Do 6 million acres vanish? And I don't think that they do. I think that that survey essentially showed, uh, just horrible opinion of the farmer about what his 24 was going to look like and so or her and, you know so you come in here and i do think corn acreage as far as the intentions for yeah, i still call it an intentions because not everyone finished up you know this was as of june 1 and not everyone was done yet uh how much corn were you going to plant or how much corn was the uh what you were going to report to be planted and i don't know i've got to think corn creeps up i mean i think the trade is is definitely trading above a 90. OK, um, so if you did get a surprise, I mean, if you do get a surprise today, my personal opinion is that uh, if you were going to get a, a, a real strong market move, my opinion is that it would be to the high side because of how the markets perform coming into this report. But, yeah, we think corn, beans and wheat are going to be higher. OK, so the average trade guess, and these are the Reuters survey numbers for corn acreage is ninety point three five. I have felt as if the market is trading something higher than that. Like I, I said, I think yesterday, if you were to poll large money managers, they never, they would never tell you, but I think they're trading a 91, 91 mm -hmm. and a half. And yeah. ideally for the sake of the market, we come in below that. And uh, that would be supportive to price action. What about these stocks numbers? I mean, we're looking at big year over year increases, 19% higher in corn, 20% uh, higher, 21% higher in soybeans, 20% higher in wheat. Is there any potential for surprise here? There is. There is a potential for a surprise. I mean, like I said to you, I, you know, you and I talked, uh, you know, on Wednesday and essentially a couple things that I see going on. Corn stocks are still in bean stocks will be higher. We know that um, it's, especially on the bean side. I've just seen a lot of origination issues. You know, folks telling me in the origination business, hey, I'm having a hard time finding beans. Where are all these beans at? You know, and mm -hmm. so uh, regionally speaking, I do think that there's uh, areas there's just not a whole lot of beans there. I'll be watching pretty closely just to see, hey, where are the beans? You know, farmers don't typically like putting beans in the bin at home. You know, uh, some do, but it, it, historically, uh, they put the corn in the bin, they haul the beans into town, and they're done with it. Um, but to me, corn usage, corn disappearance has been quite strong through this marketing year so far. Uh, sometimes you will get a, a big surprise on these stocks reports. I mean, is this one of those years that you would see that? Um, you got you got to hope so. I mean, because we do need we do need a lifeline here. Uh, and I do think that this is something that could happen today. I don't think it's going to be massive, uh, but I think the corn disappearance will be pretty strong. And who knows? Beans may come in below what people think. Yeah, we absolutely need a lifeline. 
U.S. corn export sales increased slightly last week. Net corn sales were reported at 21 million bushels. The print was up 6% from the previous week, but down 39% from the prior four-week average. Mexico was the largest corn buyer for the week. Net soybean sales fell below pre-report expectations at 10 million bushels. The print was down 49% from the previous week and down 19% from the prior four-week average. China was the largest buyer for the week. During the third week of the 24-25 marketing year, net wheat sales surpassed pre-report expectations at 25 million bushels. Unknown destinations were the largest buyers for the week. Old crop corn and soybean sales were a mixed bag. Uh, China was in for some old crop beans. I don't think old crop corn and soybeans is the issue here. We've only got a couple months left in the marketing year. We're going to hit USDA targets within a margin. Wheat sales have actually started off pretty good. I mean, uh, better at least. I think that the uh, big drop in prices in the U.S. has spurred some demand. Here's new crop. Uh, China has purchased zero new crop U.S. corn and soybeans. And uh, soybeans and, and the demand thing there is especially problematic. I don't think it's too early now to panic about new crop soybean sales. They're the worst of the last 10 years. China's bought nothing. We've got less sold on the export market for new crop delivery than we did in 2019, which was the trade war. Um, am, am I correct? Is it time to panic about this? I think the market's panicking. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no question. Like you said, we haven't, we haven't had this. Uh, China's always been in buying new crop beans for, for, for some time. I think it's very interesting to see their purchasing habits this year. And then, you know, you look at actually what, what their weather looks like right now, and it's not particularly uh, favorable. No, I do think that as far as what they're going to go for, you know, for, for instance, for corn, uh, you could be looking at Chinese import program being pretty strong here moving forward. Uh, right now, it sucks for us. And uh, I just uh, think it shows you they're not going to buy off of us unless they have to. Uh, but I do think there that could be one thing that could happen, Joe. I mean, you just go back to 2020. You know, and what happened in 2020 is that we're all standing around here in August saying this the, this year sucks and, and we're not going to make any money this year, right? Uh, you come into August uh, and it wasn't just Chinese purchases, but don't fool yourself. That was, that was a, a big, big factor in this market taking off and doing what it's done the last three or four years. And so, uh, you know, you had these Chinese purchases, Dre Shaw comes in and then all of a sudden everything changes as far as 20 is concerned. If the Chinese do decide that, Hey, uh, we are going to go have to go ahead and buy a fair amount of beans off the U.S. And I'm not sure that they'll say that. I said if they do uh, and if they have a corn program, which I think that is very likely uh, if their weather continues as it is, I think it could definitely be a market mover. Yeah, we talk about China so much because if there's one thing on the demand side of the ledger that can move the market really quickly and change the situation really quickly, it's China comes in and there's a bunch of flash sales of corn or soybeans, you know, in, in the course of just a week or two. And that can happen. We've seen it happen before. We just haven't seen it happen in a long time. Uh, we could desperately use the business. We did have a we did have a flash sale of soybeans on Thursday. U.S. exporters sold four million bushels of beans to unknown destinations for delivery during the 24-25 marketing year. Year to date, this is the fifth flash sale of soybeans for the 25-25 marketing year, totaling 24 million bushels. Is that it? Is that China getting started finally? I mean, that's kind of what we heard yesterday. Um, there's a few people saying that they thought that the Chinese were the ones that were in there buying those beans. And maybe that's why, you know, you saw early on, there was a little enthusiasm in the bean market. So who knows? I mean, it's, it's hard to know. As you know, you, we usually don't find out when it happens. So it's not a big amount, but it would be good to at least uh, see them on the board. Argentina's oilseed union workers went on strike on Thursday. The SOEA oilseed union is based in northern Rosario, which is home to the majority of the country's soybean processing plants and ports. The strike is in protest of President Javier Malay's labor reform proposal. The proposal is awaiting a vote in the lower house of Congress. The union had planned to go on strike earlier this month over the proposal, but opted against it after the government ordered the protest to be canceled. I'd say mostly non-issue. This happens like multiple times per year, these strikes. Um, I think that there had been some concern about maybe not enough meal flowing out of Argentina. I mean, that's what people have talked about. And that's typically what you're going to hear whenever it comes to Argentina. But as you said, I mean, you know, a strike, I guess, at the right time can certainly move the market, especially if they think there's any legs to it. But they just happen so often that it's hard to get too excited about it. Yeah, I'm not uh, overly excited about that headline. 
Automation and AI are making their way into ag equipment. The advancements are being introduced at a time when the American farmer is aging and farm workers are difficult to find. John Deere has launched a tractor that can plow fields while being controlled via a smartphone. Robots and drones are also becoming more popular on farms when it comes to spraying crops. Farmers, however, have been somewhat reluctant to embrace the innovations. The cost of the, te of the technology is also another, bar another barrier, especially considering the current state of farmers' narrow profit margins. Most um, normal, most, most uh, like city people, Matt, would be shocked by the technology that exists on the farm today. Uh, but some of the stuff that's forthcoming and, and it's already being used is is pretty incredible. You probably know more about this than me driverless tractors i mean where where are we actually at yeah i mean it, it it is incredible technology but and i know you were just reading the headline kenzie but i don't know anybody that plows anymore <laughs> so oh, <okay>. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just messing with you but uh, here's the thing joe i mean i've got i could do this okay i could be sitting here in my combine and tell my track i've got the technology to do it tell my tractor to come pick me up with the auger wagon okay yeah. that technology exists for a whole lot of folks and so you've got uh, basically truck drivers who uh, may be the ones uh, you, so you've got home base, you know, for your, for your auger wagon, then your tractor sitting there. And when it's time to come get you, uh, the tractor pulls alongside you and, and, and is running exactly where it needs to run. I can control it from the cab. I've never paid for it, quite frankly. Uh, you know, I don't have an issue with it by any means. I've got friends that do it, uh, but driverless tractors are certainly a thing. Now, clearly, uh, transportation between fields is an issue that they, they're going to have to get past, um, you know, because a lot of us, you know, drive from one field to the next on the highway. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not too excited about driverless uh, uh, tractor going down the highway, uh, you know, until we have that completely honed. Uh, but bottom line is the technology exists. And it is incredible. There's no doubt people wouldn't would be blown away by the kind of technology most of us use. You ever seen the videos of the of the uh, like heavy equipment operators who work from home and they've got this yeah. like big like giant screen and they're operating you know a big backhoe or excavator or whatever and uh, they're doing it from a thousand miles away. I mean like the the technology out there for this sort of stuff is crazy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've got a friend that 15 years ago was running a drone in the Middle East from Las Vegas from the from the base yeah. out there. You know, I mean, this technology has been around for quite some time, but it is going on in agriculture at this point. And it is to the point where if you had a huge tract of land, you could literally run everything from from home if you had yeah. to. Uh, but most producers want to be right there make sure everything for instance if you're working ground what, what's the ground working like you know what, what does everything look like i want to see it with my own eyes and that's the way that i am so it makes it a little bit tougher i think in agriculture especially if conditions aren't just right what did uh, cattle do yesterday uh they were a bit lower feeders were down an average of one dollar and one cent except for 15 cents higher in the back contract live cattle were an average of 55 cents lower except for a buck 47 higher and unchanged in the front two contracts box beef was mostly unchanged yesterday choice end of the day at 323.33 that was up 48 cents and select end of the day at 302.70 that was down 16 cents quick uh cattle market thoughts matt Shocked that they performed the way they did after cattle on feed last Friday, to yep. be perfectly honest with you. And I think it tells you that there's a lot of folks out here that don't want to do anything but stay at least flat or long cattle because they see the future cattle on feed reports as being super friendly. Outside markets on Friday, U.S. dollars flat, stocks are up, bonds are off a little bit, crude oil is up 64 cents in the August WTI at 82.38. Remember, guys, report at 11 a.m. Central. Uh, we'll talk to you Monday. Have a nice weekend.